Hi, it's John here again with another Indie Creative uh, Entrepreneur's Journey. And this time I've got John Gale here, who's a startup consultant of Talago. And before we dive into what he does and how he helps entrepreneurs and their startups, John, maybe you can share a little bit about what lights you up, what gets you excited each day. Hey, I really like to work with all the positive energy you get out of startup CEOs. It's just great to walk into a room and sit down and experience that energy and engage with them. Makes my day. Absolutely. And I definitely like for more conversations, I, I can sense that that like you really love what you do. And how did you get started with that? Like what was it that kind of led you uh, from your origin of just basically I believe you worked as a uh, engineer and then like how did you start getting involved with startups themselves? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a typical uh, electrical engineer with an MBA. And after working as an engineer for a while, I became a vice president and chief technical officer of a merger and acquisitions unit. It was part of uh, International Thomson, which is now Thomson Reuters. And I had been involved with startups before that, but that really got me seriously involved. We, we launched some, we acquired some, and uh, then I left there to become a consultant. So I've been a consultant quite a while and worked with startups both on the east coast of the united states and 12 years of silicon valley and now a few years primarily in the eu and what is it that like kind of for you that like you've learned or you've um that basically the one thing that you see that you wish that um folks knew about as a startup like if, like in other words uh, entrepreneurs, different times, they have ideas for startups, they have different ideas for businesses, but what's the one thing that you you find that like you wish that like more entrepreneurs knew before they got into the you know, startup? Well, it really depends on the ecosystem they're in. If they're in an ecosystem like Silicon Valley, there's a lot of people around that they can talk to and they can learn whatever they need to know. And uh, London also provides a lot of that. Uh, Berlin provides a little less, but a lot of it. But then as you go to other places, uh, you get less and less. So, for example, mm. uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan is a very interesting place, but the ecosystem isn't as big and as powerful and as easy to find the right contact as it is in Silicon Valley. The, the thing that I find that entrepreneurs often think is uh, what keeps them from starting their business and stuff is funding and capital. and. I think you and I know that that's often not the case. The often it's that they um, are trying to put the cart before the horse. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, about how you've you know, seen entrepreneurs make that mistake? Well, sure. Uh, so let me back up a little bit. There's things that you ought to do before you form a company, and frequently mm. those aren't done, but we can talk about that later. Later on, uh, you need to figure out when you need to really raise money, why you're raising it, what you're going to do with it. It's very difficult to raise money from anybody other than friends, family, and fools unless you've got uh, paying customers. If you've got paying customers, let's say you've got 10 paying customers and that that's producing some interesting amount of revenue a month, uh, then you can go to an investor, the investor can say, okay, I've got something I can look at, I can talk to those customers, I can verify that what you're doing is mission critical to some particular role in some sector, and I can decide you know, whether or not that's something I want to invest in. The problem is when the startup doesn't think that he needs to be mission critical, uh, in other words, he thinks he can offer something that's a nice to have instead of a have to have. It's a lot mm. harder to sell that, so it's harder to get investors to invest in it. Or the startup doesn't have paying customers, and the investor says, well, gee, this sounds interesting, but how do I know that the market cares? You have to have market mm. traction before an investor is going to be ready to talk. When you're ready to start talking to an investor, it's going to take you three to six months in order to raise money. The best way to do it is to go to an investor and say, hey, I need money in six, seven months, and so what I want to do is come back to you in two to three months and start doing a serious uh, fundraise. I'd like to know if you're interested in my sector and the sorts of things that we do, and if you are, what do I need to bring back to show you that we're interesting when I come back in two to three months? And what you're really trying to do there is get that investor to start that process with you a little faster. but you know, really learn if he's interesting or if he can refer you to somebody who would be interested in what you're doing. 
so that you can move down a path that makes sense for both of you. Yeah, I think that's also one of the things I've noticed as well is that too often uh, entrepreneurs only, you know, like kind of contact people once they need the funding. So in other words, they tend to go, oh, I need, you know, like kind of funding like today or tomorrow and stuff like that. And then at that point, um, it's really too late. I And too late in the sense that like they haven't prepared the things that they need to for the investors, um, you know, like in terms of paperwork, in terms of documentation, and they don't have, um, they haven't been tracking things and stuff to really show, you know, like kind of the, the proof that they are where they say they are and stuff like that. Um, and and I, I guess the bottom line is that like they um, also haven't really formed the relationship too with this investor, which is um, certainly a key part about it. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the importance of forming relationships with investors before they need the funding? Sure. The longer your relationship is with the investor, the easier it's going to be to make something happen uh, in a reasonably short period of time. If the investor's known you for four years and understands the type of things that you did, maybe you were a vice president in some other startup and he knows what that startup did and that you had a uh, good contribution to that successful exit, then he's going to be interested in the sorts of things that you do when you start a startup by yourself. And so you can talk to them. Now, so for example, I have a friend in Silicon Valley who had an idea for a new company. So what he did was he put together a PowerPoint and he showed it to me and asked me what I thought. And nobody had seen it prior to me seeing it. And the next guy to see it was going to be an investor who previously invested in him, who had known him through several startups. And he was basically going to say to the investor, I've got this idea. If I give you a full-blown business plan, would you be likely to put money into that? Does it make sense for us to try to launch this company? You know, that's the ideal sort of relationship that you have. Mm. Another way to get around that, I was working with a, a strategic uh, venture capital fund in a major company, and I took a startup into them. And the guy started out his presentation by pulling out uh, a little plastic box, and inside that box he had five chips, which were different semiconductors that he had designed. And then he pulled out a stack of blueprints for those uh, semiconductors. And then he pulled out a one sheet of paper that listed the key executives above each one of those groups where he'd done that work. And he said to my client, you probably know half of these people. That's the excellent way to raise money. My client got up, he went out of the room, came back with five people. Two months later, the guy had money. I mean, so you, if you've got the right set of relationships in your sector where you can demonstrate that you have a history of launching new products into a particular sector, and then you go to somebody and say, hey, I've got this new idea, I own all the IP, and I've got this history of launching products successfully into the sector, the investors like to see that. And what they, did you they, say? What would you say though, like for folks who like they're, you know, like kind of, and some of the different people I work with, they're creative and like they, um, they have ideas and they have designs and stuff like that, but they're not quote unquote business folks and everything. Um, in fact, they may even be, you know, somebody who has a design for invention and everything, but they just like, you know, like they're just saying, you know, like, oh, I'm not a business type. I'm not, you know, like there's this kind of thing in, in especially around the um, creative realm that like I'm not a suit and stuff like that. What would you say to somebody who like kind of says, you know, I don't have that kind of head for, you know, like kind of um, or focus for like kind of building a business. I just want to like kind of make my product or I just want to make my um, creation and stuff. Well, you need to have a well-balanced team. The investor wants to invest in a team. So what you need to do is figure out what's the team that you need at this early stage for whatever it is you're going to make. And that varies depending on what type of product you're going to make and what type of sector you're going to uh, launch it into. But you probably need a technical guy, you probably need a marketing guy, and you probably need a CEO guy, uh, man or woman in each case. And so you're going to go through a process to find those people. And remember that when you create your uh, pitch deck, 
uh, you're going to have to explain why those people are the world-class people if you're trying to do something that's a world-class company. Or maybe they're a regional or metropolitan class uh, persons or people uh, if you're trying to do something on a smaller scale. But the investor wants to know why those are the best people for this particular startup because then the investor can have confidence that he's investing in the right team. And then if he has that confidence, if you need to change things and you run into a little trouble, he's going to be tolerant. If he loses that confidence in the team, you've got a major problem. So let's say that somebody who's, they have um, somewhat of a team, they have you know somewhat of a business model and stuff that they are you know kind of just getting things going and everything, but they've still got a long way to go to actually like kind of really have a, a business, you know, like they, they haven't really even formed the company and stuff. They've got some sales, they just, but they've also, you know, like kind of clearly they've got something, you know, like there's some potential there and stuff. Like how do they know, like kind of like, like who can they talk to to kind of like really help them to see like what the, is um, the full potential of it or like how they can really take it from where they're at to like really a no kidding business and stuff. Okay, so they can talk to guys like me, or they can go to, for example, my website at www.telego.com. If you go to the publication section there, you'll find some white papers, and one of those white papers, uh, which is also listed at the Angel Capital Association uh, website, it'll tell you how to get there. That tells you how to put together a presentation for an early stage investor. And uh, as you'll see from the front cover of that, there's 15 different guys from the Silicon Valley uh, community who participated as editorial review board folks there. So there's a lot of discussion and experience that went into that. That will give you a good guide of what you need to put together in order to have a, a decent presentation uh, to show to an investor. And you also use that same presentation with a little modification to show to stakeholders, potential employees, potential customers, and so forth. Uh, obviously, you don't tell all of them all of the information. You, you know, select the pieces that make sense. But uh, you need to have some interaction with somebody who understands ecosystems, either you know from an incubator or a, a consultant, who can help you understand the things that need to be done at your stage of the corporate life cycle of a startup. And there are things you should do before you form a company. Then there's other things you should do before you try to raise money. There's other things you should do before you try to scale, et cetera, et cetera. And what if um, the folks, like they're not quite ready to, you know, like uh, bring in a consultant, they're, they want to just learn more and stuff like that. Other than your site, um, so you, I think you mentioned something about that you're looking at uh, starting a series of talks to invite uh, other guests who have startup and, um, other expertise? Yeah, I'm going to put together a series of videos uh, on different uh, areas of expertise that are important to startups. Uh, but, you know, you can also go to incubators. Some incubators offer more uh, value than others as for any product. Uh, you can go to different ecosystems. Some ecosystems are more suited to some markets than others. For example, pharma is really strong in Berlin. Hydroponics is strong in Amsterdam. Mm. Uh, fintech is strong in London. Uh, nanotech is strong in a number of places. It's certainly in Silicon Valley, but uh, nanotech also has some strength in other places. So you need to understand who's got the knowledge and expertise and uh, startup experience that's relevant to your case and go seek out those people and talk to them. Awesome. Yeah, and certainly as we, one of the things I like to share all the time is that uh, your, your success is the average of the five people you, you spend the most time with and stuff. So uh, if you've been watching this, spending time with John Gill and myself, we, this is a great opportunity to kind of share his knowledge and uh, I'm looking forward to his talks and stuff. Um, John, thanks again for coming by and uh, definitely look forward to kind of, you know, seeing the talks once you get it started. Okay, great. And uh, for those who want to read some uh, white papers, take a look at, or for that matter, blog posts, take a look at www.talig.com 
and I, I hope you find useful information there. Best of luck. Awesome. Thanks, John.